All warfare is based on deception. Hence, when we are able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must appear inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When far away, we must make him believe we are near. In 227 BC, when the state of Qing was besieging the city of Zhao, the Qing general Wang Jian ordered his troops to cut down the trees and use them to construct hundreds of wooden siege towers. However, the towers were too heavy to move and the Qing army was unable to make any progress against the Zhao defenses. It was then that a defector from the Zhao army named Zhu Jiang came up with a plan to sabotage the towers. He suggested that the Zhao army send a team of men to the Qing camp to secretly set fire to the towers. The plan was successful and the towers were destroyed, leaving the Qing army unable to continue the siege. Unconventional warfare is a tenant of combat and its effect cannot be understated. In successful execution can end major conflicts, further new countries, and bring empires to heal. To maximize the use of unconventional warfare on a traditional battlefield, given the context of a Soviet thrust into Western Europe, the American military formulated Detachment A, a highly classified unit of the United States Army Special Forces, comprised of the creme de la creme of the Army, the Green Berets, to conduct sabotage, intelligence gathering, and coordinate partisan activity behind the front lines. The detachment was fully integrated into German society, speaking the language, working standard jobs, and carrying out normal civil duties. However, the unit was obviously never activated, and the planning was shelled somewhere in the annals of the Pentagon, until one could speculate the dust in the file blew off in 2014, when then-president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, rejected a proposed trade agreement with the European Union in favor of closer ties with Russia. This decision sparked widespread protests throughout Ukraine, which escalated into violent clashes between protesters and police in the capital city of Kiev. Protests eventually led to Yanukovych's ouster in February 2014 and the installation of an interim government. However, these events also led to increased tensions between Ukraine and Russia, which culminated in the annexation of Crimea by Russia in March of 2014. In the aftermath of the revolution, the conflict between Ukraine and pro-Russian separatists in the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine intensified. The separatists, who were supported directly by Russia, declared independence from Ukraine and seized control of several key cities in the region. The Ukrainian government responded by launching a military operation to retake control of the region. The Ukrainian state provides a tactical advantage to NATO by denying Russia in the area, and during this period, NATO began to modernize the Ukrainian armed forces into a capable fighting force, with member states such as the United Kingdom contributing to the effort. And in January of 2022, it appeared possible that this eight-year process could lead to the ascendancy of Ukraine into NATO, with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky calling for his nation's integration into the alliance. However, Big P was clearly bothered by this, and as hundreds of thousands of Russian forces amassed in Ukraine's borders, everyone in the world apart from useful idiots was anticipating an attack similar to what had been expected the height of the Cold War. Russian armor blitzing over weary defenders, demoralized by eight years of war, and that within three days Russian banners would be flying in Kiev, and the remains of the Ukrainian army scrambling to Lviv. But that's not what happened. Like clockwork in the days following February 24th, a rash of incidents on critical Russian military installations and infrastructure spread not only within newly occupied territories, but hundreds of miles within, Rus within the Russian Federation in Belarus. Railway bombings prevented troops from being mobilized to the front. Certain Russian Air Force installations were crippled. Fuel depots and ammunition stores were lit ablaze, which alongside generalized incompetence and confusion within the ranks of the Russian armed forces, Forces undermined the Kremlin's lightning offensive and speared the myth of Russia's infallibility in the region. Although this may be totally speculative, and it just might be, former US operator Jack Murphy states these attacks fit a specific target selection criteria and sleeper cell units such as Detachment A would have been executing. A lot of incidents appearing as if they were copy and pasted off a of Special Forces unconventional warfare manual, a classic sabotage campaign given the speed of these targets being hit. It is likely that these operations and sites were pre-planned and that there were teams, whether they be Ukrainian or otherwise, on the ground sabotaging the Russian war machine. However, these black operations carry a heavy penalty if the operators are caught by enemy intelligence services. As the war progressed and the Ukrainian defenders were emboldened by successful counter-offensive, the Internal Russian Security Service, the FSB, was at work foiling infiltration attempts. And on Christmas Day, of all days, Russia's FSB domestic security agency announced that it had killed a group of saboteurs from Ukraine attempting to cross into a Russian border region. It added that they were carrying German submachine guns, navigation equipment, and four improvised explosive devices. A video shared by news agencies and attributed to the FSB showed several bloodied bodies sprawled on the ground, wearing winter camouflage and carrying guns. Russia has accused pro-Kiev forces of a number of sabotage attacks, including a blast that damaged a bridge linking Annex Crimea to Russia. It is apparent that the Russians, despite blaming the plethora of operations on improper smoking practices, have inadvertently acknowledged that these attacks are being carried out by someone. As at the end of 2022, Russian lawmakers back long prison terms for saboteurs, pointing to emerging terror threats, including from foreigners, amid the Ukraine conflict. Now, in the more speculative part of this discussion, one should consider the Russians' response to these actions. The domestic Russian narrative has been shouting that they are fighting the whole of NATO in Ukraine. And obviously, this narrative is influencing the decision-making in the Kremlin. So when we observe enhanced mainstream media coverage of derailment of trains carrying toxic polyvinyl chloride and causing an ecological disaster in Ohio, with further derailments near Detroit, warehouse fires in Florida, and the infamous extraterrestrial communist 
spy balloons seen over the US. We must consider the possibility of saboteur infiltration of the US mainland, or what is most likely the case, the US sabotaging itself through underfunded infrastructure and political division. The effectiveness of unconventional warfare in the context of the war in Ukraine is difficult to quantify and I am almost certainly nowhere near competent to surmise such a metric. However, if you were to consider the thoughts of the average mobilized or soon to be mobilized Russian soldier or Wagnerite in Ukraine, witnessing attacks far from the front line, with whispers in his ear of direct NATO involvement, facing down a battle-hardened Ukrainian who believes the world is behind him, and American spooks are making things go boom within the borders of Russia, it is clear that if anything the West is conducting a very effective psychological operation. As always, we'd like to thank you guys for watching, and for those new to the channel, you're welcome to subscribe. Do let us know in the comments how outlandish my claims are, and why I'm wrong, if you haven't already.